So I would argue we're actually going the opposite direction. I'm not so sure we are muscles getting healthier over the generations because simply the inactivity prevalence is higher and higher. You can see this in kids, in 15-year-olds. There, there are studies also in Belgium that the physical activity amounts and also just the performance is going down. Beatnik. Let's talk about health. Conversations about topics that improve your well-being. You're about to hear a conversation with Dr. Gomar Dulst from the Laboratory of Exercise and Health at ETH Zurich, Switzerland. I'm Peter Bietenholz, your host and founder of Beatnik, a Los Angeles-based company that powers positive behavioral health. Next to our podcast, we also have an extensive blog on our website and social media at Beatnik with over 1,400 science-based entries that covers all aspects of health and well-being. Make sure to check it out and follow us there as well. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Gomar Dulst from the Laboratory of Exercise and Health at ETH Zurich. Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to have you here. When I prepared for this podcast, I realized that the skeletal muscle connection is not something that is featured prominently in the mainstream media or even on health and fitness related platforms which is strange considering its importance and that we probably wouldn't be able to get out of bed every morning without that connection working properly. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself. What has your journey in science been so far? And of course, in particular, what made you or when did you decide to study muscles? Yes, Peter, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. A very nice studio that you, that you arranged. So yes, I'm Gomar Dulst. I'm a Belgian. I, uh, I've been born in, in Lier, close to Antwerp. And yeah, I've been, been involved in sports actually my whole life. I played um, at a very high level uh, golf, actually a sport that you would not uh, <laughs> think that I would, I would play if you see me, but uh, actually I played golf at a, at a high level. I, I went to um, a specific school for that. And we almost also, two muscles, for, uh, almost too much yeah. muscles for golf. <laughs> in, in, that, in that, uh, that time, I was not that, that muscular actually. Um, but we did a lot of of fitness uh, next to golf so I was always getting into it um, and then yeah I decided not to pursue my golfing career so I was, was close to I was I went actually to, to, to America for seven seven months contemplating should I go to college the typical uh, yeah thing that Europeans do is they go to college in, in um, America to pursue a golfing career I didn't do it and I went to college in Belgium I, I studied sports sciences uh, there in Leuven which is let's say the, the biggest university or one of the biggest universities in in Belgium and of course I was uh, I was super intrigued by by just sports by exercise by health uh, from from the get-go uh, but most importantly because of my it's typical uh, typical story about uh, because of my my teacher my professor uh, related to exercise physiology so in in, in the master or, or uh, I think the, the third year we received a very nice lecture uh, related to everything uh, that that is involved in in how the body moves and how how the different organs are affected by movement and most importantly how um, the cardiovascular system is affected by, by, by exercise, so exercise physiology. Um, yeah, so I decided to pursue a, a PhD in that area, uh, so I joined the uh, the laboratory of exercise uh, of, of uh, um, exercise physiology at KU Leuven did a PhD there for four, five and a half years, where I studied the effects of high altitude on muscle mass. So if people go to altitude, um, they experience a loss of muscle mass. Certainly, mm -hmm. when they when they are there for multiple weeks, it's actually well established that people lose muscle mass, um, yeah, like ten to fifteen percent. And it's not only under nutrition; it's also purely the hypoxia, so the lack of lack of ex uh, oxygen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is fascinating. So I, I looked into the enzym enzymatic path pathways that are leading to this, and then I followed my um, yeah my tutor at that time, or at least uh, someone who was. Uh, 
collaborating with. Um, she, so Catherine de Bock, she was able to start her own laboratory in, in uh, Zurich at uh, ETH, uh, one of the, the best universities in, in the world. So it was an easy choice for me to follow her and to actually kind of start with her, the laboratory of exercise and health, where I, I mean, we can talk about this, but I, I kept studying muscles and, and which factors actually affect muscle health and how uh, muscles grow or also how muscles uh, uh, reduce in size, for example, in aging. Was there in an initial spark that ignited your interest for muscles in particular, maybe an injury or maybe um, you had other issues with muscles or was it simply something because because like with when you play golf, um, I assume golf is more about skills and not so much about muscle yes. mass and power yeah this is this is kind of a, a an idea that that has been floating around with people who are not really involved in the golfing world but this is of course to some extent true but um since the the the, the birth or the coming of of tiger woods he changed the whole game so in in let's say 1998 he came into the scene and he was powerful muscular he hit the ball 40 yards further than the rest of his uh, competitors okay. <laughs> and that was a, a part of his genetics and a part of because if he trained really hard like actual like how athletes train and indeed before it was uh, um, the fat guys with a cigar that, that oh that, yeah that, absolutely that, that, that absolutely. played played the game uh, but now it has completely professionalized so um, uh, golfers are considered athletes they do explosive movements they do a lot of strength training because it's a, it's a it's a massive advantage to hit the ball further mm -hmm. even if you hit it five to ten yards further it's a it's a huge advantage so this um, of course um, is is now the Last 15 years happening with also other players. So, um, yeah, this this was was interesting for me because I was starting doing some fitness during my my times in the golfing world, and then Tiger Woods was also really at the top of his game. Um, so that was one of the sparks, and also just. The fact that I was involved in sports during my, my university time, I mean, of course, muscles is what move the body, is uh, what also, what I learned is also, uh, let's say, uh, are, are contributing to the fountain of youth. If you are healthy, you probably are uh, have, have healthy muscles or, or vice versa, even. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are now more and more studies showing that there are, that, that, that um, muscles are Really, you have to look at it as an organ, like the liver, like like other organs that that produce hormones that could be healthy, that could be healthy for the brain. Um, so by doing exercise, you actually produce hormones that could be healthy for oh, okay. other organs as well. Okay. That's very important. Okay. So that's why exercise also is healthy on the long term. Not only because you keep your muscles health, but uh, healthy, but also because you keep the other other organs healthy oh, because okay. of the exercise. Now, before we um, go into the muscle science in particular, um, what does a day in the life of an exercise and health scientist at ETH look like? Do you teach? Do you do research? Is it a mix of both? Um, perhaps you could also tell us a, a little bit what kind of research you're doing right now or have been doing in the past. Yeah, so it's a it's a combination of both. I actually come just back from from a lecture. I gave a lecture this morning, uh, exercise physiology to master students at ETH, where we talked about uh, wearables and how to improve your fitness with wearables, for example. Um, and then, so that's a small part. Let's say six to to eight hours of per week of of preparation, and then also giving the lectures two hours per week. Um, and then also doing the actual experiments. So, so as a postdoc or a PhD, you are allowed a lot of freedom from at least my boss, uh, Catherine. She tells you, okay, we have to go in that direction. And then you go into the lab. We do a lot of mouse experiments, uh, experiments with humans, mostly in my PhD, now less. And also um, uh, experiments with cells. So okay. you, can, you can, we have actually the, the whole um, arsenal of tools at our, at our availability at ETH, where we can study specific molecules, where we can sp uh, study specific proteins, how they affect the muscle. Um, so we actually do the, the experiments and then also we uh, write the manuscripts. We, we think about how to 
add it to a, a nice, let's say, um, paper. And then we, we, we make the figures uh, and we, we send it out to, to academic publishers. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how, how it all uh, works. And that's, that's our, our, our main job to, let's say, generate information for society. You mentioned mice. Um, it, it would be interesting to animals basically have sort of like the same or a similar muscle build up to humans? Yeah, so so it is. Yeah, so mice are very interesting because um, so this immediately uh, makes me think about fiber types. So maybe you, you've heard about uh, humans. We have basically two types of fibers, um, muscle fibers, I mean, um, the fast twitch, so the explosive athletes, and then the slow twitch fibers. And human muscle is very heterogeneous, meaning that um, you have mostly 50-50. For example, you take your quadriceps, you take a cross-sectional biopsy, and uh, you see around 50% scattered around the, the, the whole muscle. With mice, it's a little bit different. Um, they have specific muscles that are predominantly type 1, so slow fibers, and specific muscles, most of the muscles actually, are very explosive. Um, so more the posterior muscles, such as the soleus, one of the calf muscles, is a very slow muscle. And that's interesting as a scientist because then you can look at the effects of, for example, amino acids of exercise mm -hmm. specifically to one specific fiber type. In humans, it's, it's also possible you can take out one specific fiber and then measure it in the lab. But on the whole muscle level, you likely have a, have a very heterogeneous mix. For example, that's a, a, mass, a strong difference between animals and, and humans. Um, but there's very much... Um, close connections. For example, they have a, a similar digestive system. Mm -hmm. So if you would provide them uh, proteins such as whey or vegan proteins such as um, um, pea rice protein, the digestion and the, the appearance of the amino acids in the blood will be quite similar to humans. So that's also an advantage we oh, can okay. then use, for example. Also, um, how does the brain um, muscle connection in animals because obviously they have a different cognitive uh, system or function. So, like, how does that work with animals? Do they know, like humans, okay, I need to strengthen my muscle or I need to move in a different way? Or, like, how do they learn to move? How does that work? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question because, uh, first of all, I don't know the exact answer. I'm not a, a neuroscientist, but... Um, I think one of the, the interesting differences between the, the, let's say, the sedentary human now that doesn't do too much activity, takes the car, takes the train and, and doesn't walk too much or do, doesn't do uh, exercise um, compared to an, a mouse is quite different because a mouse is kind of born to run. Meaning that maybe also a human, but at least they don't do it anymore. They don't have the motivation anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do I mean with that? So what we use is um, as a model of exercise in mice is voluntary running. So we, we take a wheel, a little wheel, and um, we put it into the cage. And we don't do anything. We don't say anything. We don't stimulate anything. We just put it there. The mice run. They, they, they run eight kilometers a night. A mm -hmm. night. Eight kilometers, which is tremendous amount, right? Just voluntary. In humans, it's different. So the motivation to exercise is actually a very interesting topic that, that um, I think is fascinating. And, and, and one, one professor um, is actually doing research on it, is why do mice yeah, run? Why do they choose to go to that wheel and run? And why do most humans not do this? That's kind of the intriguing question, because if we can get people to uh, or motivate them to do more exercise, I think then that would be already uh, uh, be better for many diseases, uh, cardiovascular diseases, for example. Um, I also I also wonder how that works with babies, toddlers, little children who are probably more animal like in the sense of yes. cognitive yes. functions when they b begin to move when they crawl or like when they like try to get up is that basically um, done by imitation whatever they see that their parents do or is it something intrinsically that tells them okay I have to get up I have to move or like do you know how that works? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly how that works. It's not really in my expertise, but but it's, it's absolutely true that 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 
people, that the young kids uh, are much more active. I mean, just de facto from 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 how they they move, they play much more. Uh, and if we take that away, it's a it's a a very big disadvantage for them growing growing up. For example, now with the screens, what you see that people use a, an iPad as a babysitter, I think it's a really yeah. bad bad trend in in, yeah, in society, yeah. and yeah. it's something we should actively fight against mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. because the movement uh, this also has to do with with my, one of my research topics. Um, there's a high likelihood that movement in um, childhood and in in adolescence has a larger impact even epigenetically at a, at a later age right Absolutely. and not only just learning meaning the the motor control learning how to bike learning how to walk right but also actually intrinsically in the muscle mm -hmm. that there are certain uh, pathways altered uh, certain biochemistry that is altered due to the movement at early mm -hmm. age that is actually even when you have a long period of sedentarism um, for example during your 20s if you then start again at your 30s you have an advantage. So um, this is early stage and it's not really shown in humans, but it has been shown in mice, uh, this muscle memory uh, effect. Uh, it's really interesting when you, um, when you um, it mentioned it, that more and more um, small kids are also stuck behind phones and tablets. Um, I had a preschool teacher who told me um, it, that it is indeed a big problem. You know, they have a lot of kids who barely know how to move. They have balance issues. Yes. They don't know how to jump across a log or uh, across a fence. Yes. Uh, so yeah, it, it is a very, very important topic for sure. Yes. yes. The question is how to change it. That's always a question. We know that's a problem, but it's not so easy to change the society mm -hmm. there. Um. Now, going back to the cognitive thing, what exactly uh, is the skeletal muscle connection? What is the importance? Um, how does this function work and how does it promote health? How do they impact each other? What do you exactly mean with the skeletal uh, muscle? So with the bone and the, and the muscle or with, um, with the brain and the muscle? or with the, the brain and the muscle, or like how the how the muscles impact the skeletal, the 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 the, the bones. Yes, the bones, or vice versa. Yeah, I mean, um, it's um, so we did a um, we did a study in in, in mice, uh, quite interestingly, where um, we had. So that's why also people also always ask like, why do you use mice? Why don't you use just humans? Right, like it's better, but some things you just can't research in humans. It's just a fact. Mm -hmm. One of the things is um, not entirely, but um, aging, for example. It is there are models in mice where we manipulate one specific gene, and they have some kind of accelerated aging. So it is very expensive to wait three years before a mouse is very old. It has to be caged for two and a half years. Uh, it's not nice for the mouse, of course. It has to be in a cage for two and a half years. So there's uh, some ethical uh, questions there. But if you can accelerate the aging in one year, they're, let's say, senile, they're hunched, they, they get gray hairs and so on, that's quite interesting. And one of the things we did is... Um, we phenotyped those mice and we checked uh, many of the, the effects of, of, of chrono chronological aging. And you saw there that, um, yeah, when the mice did not exercise, the, also the bone formation and the osteoporosis was much worse in those mice. Oh, just so, humans, huh? Yeah, so similar as, as, as humans. Uh, so there must be the, 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 the most important connection there, and that is also known, is that if you do exercise before you're 30, 35 years old, so load-bearing exercise, meaning not cycling, actually the opposite of cycling, rather running or CrossFit or jumping or whatever. The load, so the actual mechanical load that is um, uh, transferred from the muscles or from the ground to the bones uh, makes the bones, let's say, more healthy, more uh, uh, dense, uh, and so forth. So, And this kind of deteriorates when you are 35, it mm -hmm. starts to go down and it's hard to, maybe you can kind of uh, counteract it or, or diminish it, 
but you cannot like completely keep going up, right, right? Right. And that's also why, for example, cyclists, elite cyclists. I know you're, uh, you're yourself are uh, an amateur cyclist. I have been. Um, they actually have big issues with osteoporosis. Oh. Because they like it's a massive problem for them because they Very never do muscle. any steps, right? Yes. They, like yes. any, they, they they avoid uh, uh, flight uh, flights of stairs at any cost. <laughs> they do only uh, non weight bearing exercise, and this even so that's why you need the impact of the, the ground as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So cycling enough would in that case not be enough right so it's yeah, always a I was I was actually uh, that was one of my um, other questions as well but yes. maybe we can touch on that yeah, a okay. bit later on the, um, the cardiovascular activities yes. versus uh, strength yes. training you know there's always and I myself unfortunately I also lean more toward cardiovascular mm -hmm. activities as a next <laughs> cyclist maybe but um, in general terms, first, maybe it, what is considered good muscle health? How do I know if I have healthy muscles other than knowing, OK, I can um, I can bench press so yes. many kilos yes. pure, or pure performance? Uh, but how do you how do you know? How do you measure good at muscle health? Yeah, so it's a <laughs> it's a very good question. And I think um, we're at the point that only performance or predominantly performance is a good correlation to muscle health. So what do I mean with that? It, it's not only, for example, um, muscle mass. Pure, if you look at the muscle mass, it's not a direct determinant of muscle health. Mm -hmm. You could have some ed edema. You could have uh, non-functional proteins there. Um, you could have some fibrotic tissue. But if you have like a sufficient amount of strength, independent of the mass, that's a very good, let's say, parameter of muscle health. Mm -hmm. So uh, depending on the age, um, you say bench press, but people who are 60 or 65 years old yeah. doing five times a squat on a, on, a, on a chair, going on the chair and off the chair, if you are able to do this, there are specific tests for this. Um, this is a yeah, relation of, of muscle health. Um, there are also some... Uh, biochemical factors and some blood factors that you, you could measure and that's more related to muscle damage, right? Um, so what if the muscle is really unhealthy that you could pr probably measure, but um, for example, creatine kinase uh, fluctuations in the blood. But but the most important thing is that that you have some kind of performance with your muscles and um, that, that you can do specific strength exercises and also endurance exercises at a yeah, at a at an average level, let's say. Mm -hmm. And how do you how do you support muscle health, especially as you get older and the loss of muscle, obviously, yes. Yes. Uh, which is a big issue with aging, aging people. And now, of course, as people have a life expectancy of like at least 90, yes. I think yes. anyone born after 2000 That's has crazy. a life expectancy of like 120, yes. Yes. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, um, it is high, yeah. It will be interesting to see like if muscle health also kind of like sets in or like aging um, muscles, if that also sets in at a later age as well, or yeah, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. The, the key point is here: you need mechanical load, so you need weight bearing exercises on the muscle. That is something that is really well known um, in the in the sixties. They did some beautiful studies with rats, and they want to know what is actually the main driver of muscle hypertrophy. Right, we back in the sixties, they of course didn't know much. Right, they they thought, yeah, if you do some farming, uh, you probably get a uh, strong arms, but they didn't know anything about resistance training. So what did they do? They actually um, they had rats, and they uh, stimulated specific nerve in the body to maximally contract the foot. So of course you cannot ask a rat to maximally contract whatever, right? They they maximally contract the foot and then they uh, looked at specific muscles. So they looked at the muscles at the front side of the, the shin bone, the tibialis anterior, and they also looked at the calf muscles. And if you fully contract all the muscles of your, let's say, lower leg at, 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 the, at the same time, your the strongest muscles will, let's say, win, and the, the, the segment, the foot, will actually go in the direction that the strongest muscles pull. And this is what happens with um, the calf muscle. The calf muscle is stronger than your 
muscles at the front of the shin bone. So because the calf muscles contracted maximally um, and the the front, so the tibias anterior, also contracted maximally, but, but actually extended during that contraction, right? Um, it experienced much more mechanical load, mechanical tension. And interestingly, what they saw is that only the tibia anterior, so the front, um, increased in size after 8 to 10 weeks. And then they did a, another experiment where they actually put some weight to the foot. So also the, the, the gastrocnemius, so the, the, the calf muscle, was loaded. And then they saw both muscles hypertrophy, right? So this means that if you would um, just do some kind of endurance training or low load-bearing exercise, mm -hmm. you probably don't get any um, mm -hmm. muscle hypertrophy or, um, let's say, adaptations to that. So that's the key point is you need some kind of load, relative load. A bodybuilder will need more load mm -hmm. than someone who is 50-year-old and never has done any exercise. They can use resistance bands. They can do some steps, whatever, right? Um, so it has to be a high relative load um, Yeah, that, that, that fatigues the muscle. That's mm -hmm. important yeah. here. Um, and that's how you keep your muscles, let's say, healthy at a longer uh, age, okay. at an older age. Um, in terms of um, muscle health and um, strength training, there is also the issue of, of like overtraining, I guess, your muscles. And I think that is something we see at the gym. Yes, all the times you have these yes. men and women do weight training like every day. Obviously, it's not always training the same muscles, but still, like, how do you like? How do you know when it's like too much? Other than like having you know sore muscles, or like your uh, joints start to hurt. Yes. So yeah, this is. Um This is, of course, a very very individualized uh, question, I would say. Some people can handle much more training load uh, than others. So, for example, I think that, that one of the main determinants of how you react to a training plan is how well you can handle the load, right? Some people just genetically can do four times a week the same train the same muscle group and be perfectly fine. Some need only two. So, first of all, find a good coach. Find someone who understands your individual body, um, and that ask, actually asks you, how do you feel? So one of the, the better determinants to do this is to track how you feel right after and maybe two hours after the training, meaning it's called um, RPE, so, so, so it's it, 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 uh, relative subjective, like your subjective feeling, you can do from six to 20 or from one to 10, and that's... Uh, Science have shown that, that that's actually a, 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 quite a robust and, and a good way to measure how much, um, let's say, uh, load and, and how, how you feel after a training. And that's mm. it's important. Mm. That's, that, that's, that's important. So, yes, you really make, need to make sure that you recover well after a training. Because, of course, it's a, it's a typical thing that we always say, but the, the actual adaptations occur in the recovery period. Mm -hmm. And if that recovery period is too short, again, depending on the individual, then and also of the nutrition kind of, um, then you won't adapt and you can train as much as you want, you won't adapt, mm -hmm. right? So you cannot exactly know. Some people say, yeah, maybe you can use uh, DOMS, so, so the, the soreness of the muscle. Mm -hmm. But in any case, if you train long enough, the, the, there's a reduction in, in soreness in any case, right? So it's not the perfect uh, uh, marker. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's maybe the inverse marker because if you would train once a week, only once a week really hard your legs, you will always every week be sore. Mm -hmm. But if you train three times a week, the soreness goes away because mm -hmm. the muscle adapts. That's kind of how it works. How much do genes play into the, uh, into the amount of um, muscle mass? Is that very individual or like it seems some people do have more muscle mass than others? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a black box. So we, we, don't, we don't really know. That's a very short answer. Um, we know, like, let's, let's keep it like this. Yes, they have a, a strong influence, but we don't know which gene clusters actually specifically affect this. It's not so easy to investigate. Uh, why do I say this? There's been beautiful studies also 20 years ago where they did, um, they had uh, 200 families, so around 600 people, 700 people, and they let them do strength training 
um, supervised in the laboratory exactly the same training. So they did bicep curls for 12 weeks and everyone, every individual did the same amount of training, right? Same. And then they saw, they, they checked the amount of muscle mass gains over those 12 weeks. And there was a huge variability. Some people lost muscle mass, literally lost, and some gained 30%. So it had, and, and importantly, the spread was less variable within the family, meaning that genes are important. So if your brother, ga brother gained 20%, you gained probably 17%. If your brother gained 0%, you also have a higher chance to also gain 0%. So this shows clearly that genes are involved. But it's not so easy to know, okay, these genes are the ones we should target. And that's kind of, the, I think, the next step within the next mm -hmm. 10 years in sports sciences is to understand which genes are important, how can we potentially pharmacologically uh, affect these, and how can we uh, design training plans to, to, to also get the non-responders to, to respond better to training, for example. Mm -hmm. right? These are open questions, I would okay. say. How does nutrition play into this i mean obviously everybody knows protein yes yes is but uh, but is there other types of food or like that promotes muscle yeah so so if you think strength. about if you just go to fr first principles of, of of muscle mass gains or or even just strength gains and muscle health um it all situates around the net protein balance. So what does it mean? You have structural proteins, let's say the most important uh, proteins, actin and myosin, that literally drive the contractions of the protein of the of the muscle, right? And if you want to have more muscle mass or more mass in your in your 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 tissue, you want to have more of those, literally, more mass. So you need to synthesize more of those actin and, and myosin and other structural proteins. Mm -hmm. And Two, let's say three, but let's say two major external factors drive this. One, load, strength training, mm -hmm. literally loading the muscle. Yeah. Second, protein or amino acids, right? And interestingly, we know now the last six, seven years, also based on my research, that um, they independently stimulate protein synthesis, independently. But if you add them together, it's a synergistic effect. Mm -hmm. So you do strength training and then afterwards, we all know, you drink your whey shake or you eat a steak or you eat some vegan protein, right? Why do you do this? You want to stimulate muscle protein synthesis to the maximal extent and you want to do it in a synergistic way that they both stimulate your, your synthesis of proteins because the muscle wants to adapt. So we talked about recovery. For example, if you would do strength training or even endurance training, and you don't eat sufficient amount of protein in relatively close proximity to your training, then this will not lead to better recovery, actually decreased recovery, because the protein synthesis is not maximized, you see. Uh, and if you increase your protein synthesis compared to your protein breakdown over a long period of time, you will gain, for example, muscle mass or uh, tissue, tissue strength. Okay. Does protein always equal protein? I mean, obviously, yes. you know, the big one is, you know, the animal yes. versus yes. plant based. Yes. But also within animal protein, is it basically the same if I eat an egg or if I have a chicken breast? Yeah. And then also now um, I've been noticing that at supermarkets, grocery stores, everything has added protein now. I mean, you have protein bars, you have protein pudding, you have protein. Everything. Cookies. Yeah. Is there a difference in terms of like quality of protein? Let's say if I do have a protein bar, yes. is it basically the same quality protein that I get um, from an egg or a chicken? So, yeah, that's that's of course a, a kind of a hot topic and a bit I think overstated uh, topic. Uh, but but I will I will definitely uh, can you give you some some, some input there? So yes, there's difference in pro protein quality. Uh, and protein quality is majorly defined as how well can you digest the protein, how fast do the amino oh, acids okay. yep. get broken down. Yep. Yep. So the, the proteins get broken down into amino acids, uh, one. And two is uh, how much uh, leucine there is in, um, in the, the, the whole mix of amino acids. So leucine is one of the, the 20 amino acids that for some reason nature has decided to make that the trigger of protein synthesis. 
So we did some studies in cells, actually quite interesting studies, where you could provide all the amino acids or nearly all the amino acids and nothing happens with protein synthesis. But if you give leucine specifically, it gets sensed by specific enzymes, the cestrin and, and uh, LRS, and those signal towards the muscle, hey, we have sufficient leucine, we can start doing the muscle protein synthesis now. So quality of protein depends on leucine, how much there is, and how fast the leucine, let's say, can get absorbed and get into or get sensed by the muscles. And there it has clearly been shown that animal proteins have more leucine, like let's say 8% or, or 7% in good, relatively good quality uh, vegan proteins, but 11%, for example, in whey protein. So it is a slightly higher leucine content. But that doesn't mean that vegan proteins have no leucine or they're completely bad quality always. No, no, they just have less leucine. Right, so that's 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 one of the points. The thing is also that, as I said, it's a little bit overstated to to like mark this protein all the time because we simply studies have shown that if you do resistance training and you eat sufficient amount of protein, which has reasonable quality, which it may be some animal protein or high quality uh, vegan proteins, and you reach a certain point to around 1.6 grams per kilogram per body weight per day. So I weigh, I weigh 85 kilograms, this would be 190 grams, which is easily att attainable without any supplements, right? How much is that in terms of like, is that one egg, is it so? Yeah, so one egg has seven, I think, eight grams of protein, okay. and you need 190, so this is like uh, around four to five meals of 40 grams of protein spread throughout the day. So it depends a little bit. Some people easily attain this. Some people have a, need one more uh, uh, snack or, or a quark or, or some, some whey shake. But it's relatively easy to get to. You don't have to eat burgers all day. Really not. Okay. Right? And above that, if you go above that, there's no additional effect of the protein. Because, of course, the, the muscle protein synthesis, it's a, it can be maxed out as well. You cannot go forever up. You see, so um, that's why if you just eat 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight per day, if it is a bit more vegan, if it is a bit more um, animal based and you do a well-structured training plan, for example, for muscle hypertrophy, you will be fine. Okay. The extra gains will be very, very marginal with the protein quality. Is there such a thing as too much protein? In other words, can it get to a level where it becomes unhealthy and it's a big debate it, it's it's hard to say some epidemiological uh, studies where they followed people who ate high proteins they have mentioned that um, it might be might be bad for certain cancers or cer certain diseases okay. but again you can never uh, causally tell this this is like the the effect of protein uh, what is maybe one of the myths that that can be debunked here is that Kind of, no matter how much protein you eat in one meal, let's say I eat 100 grams of protein in one meal, they all get absorbed. Mm -hmm. It's not that I cannot de digest them or something. Yeah. It's just too much to maximize my yeah, protein yeah, yeah. Uh, synthesis. That's important. But they, the amino acids will be available. They will be oxidized in the liver. They will be actually transferred into fat uh, because there's an energy surplus. But you can absorb them. That's okay. important. Uh, um, I'm asking because... Like with, for example, um, vitamin D and yes. C, you can actually get yes. too much when it yes. becomes unhealthy. Yes. In, in the protein world, they have uh, done some um, kidney function uh, studies and there is very little like negative effects. It's the same with even with creatine supplementation. You can have like uh, tons of creatine, tons of protein. The kidneys are, if they're healthy, they're well uh, equipped to actually handle this. But again... Why would you do it? There's no reason. Like, yeah, there's yeah. no additional benefit of eating three grams per uh, kilogram body weight. Mm. Maybe bodybuilders, really at the elite, crazy end of the spectrum. But every healthy human being shouldn't shouldn't over overdo it with protein. There's no need. Or people seeing a bar at the grocery store and assume, oh, wow, you know, it's a protein bar. It's probably good for me in some way. Um. So, <laughs> it, it might be good if you do high load and high amount of resistance training and you really want to gain muscle that it might be useful but for 99% of the people it's not useful mm -hmm. it's marketing 
Um, in terms of like evolution, I just wonder when you would look at history of human beings, like how have uh, it muscled, evolved over over times? Have there been like study? I mean, obviously, you know, we get bigger and faster and stronger, like every a generation, it seems. Um, um, has that changed because of nutrition or because people are more active or? Yeah, um, um, maybe uh, the, the, there's an evolution indeed. In, in, in If you look at just athletic performance, right, over the last 150 years, let's say or 130 years from the 1900s when they start measuring this. For example, in explosive sports, there's a very clear trend that from the eight, 1985, there's a clear leveling off. So there was an initial nice uh, linear phase that we always drew far further, we could jump higher and so on, but there's a leveling off. We clearly are reaching the plateau of human performance, oh, okay. clearly. Um, the marginal gains are there, but it's, it's less. So I would argue we're actually going the opposite direction. I'm not so sure we, we are uh, our muscles getting healthier over the generations because simply the inactivity prevalence is higher and higher. You can see this in kids, in 15-year-olds. There, there are studies also in Belgium that the physical activity amounts and also just the performance is going down, right? Interesting. And yeah, this is this is the, the the effect. And maybe the elite athletes, if you train them well with the right technology, they can still get the marginal gains. But I would argue that the physical fitness of the the average population is going down. It clearly. The physical activity is going down for sure. Physical mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, fitness, yeah. Yeah. Fi and, and therefore linked, of course, the physical uh, performance. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't think it's going in the right direction actually, on average. And that's, uh, I think, a problem for society within the next hundred years for sure. Oh, interesting. I wonder if there are um, environmental reasons for that as well. You know, and nutrition. Obviously, the more, quality more processed, of our yeah. processed foods. Yeah, it's always the, the, the interesting thing is like it's always nutrition. It's always nutrition. But I'm, I always try to to look at it from the other side. I honestly think it's more movement. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, there's more uh, processed food. Yes, there's more seed oils. Yes, this it's not always that healthy. But it's also very clearly that people are just not moving anymore, uh, almost or much less. And uh, that's a key problem in society now. And yeah. Uh, as long as we keep everything uh, more automa uh, uh, automatic, it's not going to improve. I know this as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that is that is something that, that, that bothers me, honestly. Well, in terms of um, movement and exercise, what are your thoughts of, like, let's say, for somebody who just wants to be healthy and have fun at working out? Yeah. Um, it, we mentioned uh, a CrossFit yes. a, in our pre-discussion. I think this is something uh, also that you're interested in or like, you know, gym activity versus CrossFit outside. Yeah, so so for sure, one of the most important things is um, <clears throat> exercise adherence. So can you keep doing it? Most important thing. The rest is, let's say, yeah, Preference, um, but there are studies showing that, um, like, there is more. I, to your point, there's more uh, people that are doing aerobic activities than strength bearing or strength training activities, including Which is, myself. Yes, yes, unfortunately, yes, unfortunately I mean, <laughs> it's easier. I guess I don't know it's a why bit that easier, is. But. It's a little bit easier. Yeah, exactly. And um, so, uh, yeah, the latest reports I've seen is like 32% uh, of, depending where you really, where you look at, for example, in Romania, no one does exercise, for example. <laughs> I saw this funny. But uh, but uh, like Western countries like like uh, like uh, Switzerland and Belgium, 32% uh, do sufficient amount of uh, aerobic exercise. But 5% do strength training, enough strength training. That's really nothing. So um, if you... So that's why, why I would call people to also um, uh, get engaged in some kind of load-bearing exercise because it's so crucial for later life. Um, at this point, if you're, if you're young, you probably won't feel too much and, and it's probably fine. But if the muscle is not conditioned at, long, at, at later age and you never did any like relatively heavy strength training, then you might run into problems. Mm -hmm. um, CrossFit is a way to doing this because it's just efficient. 
you just go there. There is always a strength part in it. It's not only endurance, and it's um, yeah, a combination, literally, of both, which has been shown to actually... Um, there is an interference between, so you won't become an elite athlete in one in cycling anymore. Let's say your your goal is to cycle, then you shouldn't do whatever ten hours per week of strength training. There is an interference, but for most people, they don't want to become the next Fabian Cancellara, yeah, right? Yeah. They yeah, want to be yeah. healthier, and if you want to become healthier, you clearly have to incorporate some form of resistance mm-hmm. training, mm-hmm. and that is something that people, yeah, neglect too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then on the other hand, yeah, you just have to start going like. Uh, in action is 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 the worst. Uh, yeah, 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 like like th- then yeah, yeah. nothing happens. So so um, action is is what you need. Are there are there statistics like how much muscle mass that that you lose? Let's say when you don't work out at all, like a month maybe. Ah yeah. Um, so the, the muscle is an extremely plastic organ, meaning that indeed it can go up and down very very fast. So we did some uh, studies, um, not myself, I was not involved, but in my laboratory with casts. So where they put the leg into a cast and literally no movement. Mm. And then you see very 5%, 4% per week, wow. right? So again, load is important here because even when you just move, it's not high load, but it's movement, it keeps my arm same s- circumference, right? But if I just stop moving it by putting it in a cast, even though I'm completely healthy and I eat sufficient amount of protein, goes down, right? Mm-hmm. So there, there needs to be activity, simply. And yeah. Nutrition. Is it true that you shouldn't do weights and cardio within the same sort of like session or day? So this is the, the, the thing, what your goals are. If you are, um, let's say you're a, let's say one spectrum, you're a CrossFitter. You want to be best in both Areas, mm-hmm. right? You want to be maybe not the best marathon runner, but a good marathon runner, and you don't want to be a power lifter, but a, like not the best, but like ninety percent. Then I would say you need to separate the sessions as much as possible, minimum six hours. So some mm-hmm. beautiful studies in, in in rugby players where they did no um, separation, one hour separation, six hours, and. 24 hours, separation of the strength and endurance sessions, and then they saw no interference anymore at the six-hour time point. Okay. Right? So rug- rugby is, is comparable to CrossFit, for example. Mm-hmm. That said, that's good for 0.5% of the population who wants to excel in both areas. The rest of the world should just do them at the same hour. Mm-hmm. There is, an, as I said, there is some interference because of the molecular pathways that are actually uh, literally like uh, like uh, inhibiting each other. But it is, on the grand scheme of things, a marginal effect because the only goal or the, the most important goal of exercise, I think, is fun, performance and health. Mm-hmm. And the performance will be slightly less than, but the fun will be better. And also it's, it's much easier for most people to do it in one hour, right? You cannot just easily uh, uh, do two sessions a a day. I mean, it's just not very feasible. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, don't worry too much about that. Okay. And with age, I mean, uh, I'm in my late 50s, I have to admit, (laughs) fortunately. (laughs) So, it's like, how important it does become um, strength training and supporting your frame Basically, yeah, very, very, very important. So you really can. Um, so there, there are studies in in master athletes. So that's always an interesting group because um, then you can look at the effects of aging per se, kind of independent of exercise. Because that's always a thing. People say, uh, I'm, "I'm 35 years old." When they become a dad, for example, oh, and become of, because of aging, my muscle mass goes down, my body composition is uh, deteriorating, and so on. I said. It's just because of lack of exercise. It's not because of aging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in master athletes, you can see this because they keep doing exercise, right? They're whatever, power lifters, master power lifters. Until 60, they do heavy lifting every every other day. Still there, you see decline in strength. Mm -hmm. So there you can look at, okay, this is probably purely aging, right? And... There is a decline in strength, but uh, yeah, whatever, one, one, two percent per year. But it is much slower, this decline, than someone who doesn't do exercise. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So instead of finding excuses, then, yeah, it's my age, it's just lack of exercise mm-hmm. most, of, most of the times. 
Is that part of that biological age also, the more you move and exercise, that you can actually reverse your biological age? Exactly. Reverse, you can, you can just... Yeah. Then it's always like, what is the control? Is the control in these studies a, per a person who never does any exercise and mm -hmm. just ages? Or is should the control be the people who uh, remain active? You, you, you asked about um, evolution. I mean, clearly people remained much longer active uh, than, than now, previously. Right. So, so uh, yes, it's 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 a combination um, of of um, you don't really reverse. You just delay the, the aging the, process. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That you also could see in, in our in our mice, this accelerated uh, um, age aging mice. If they if you put them on a wheel, the even when they have a specific gene that 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 uh, increases mutations and increases aging, this is delayed with exercise with endurance exercise. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Instead of when they just sit in a cage for the yeah, whole life. What do mice eat, by the way? I just realized. Like, like, how do they gain? I mean, are they? Do they? Are they carnivores or? No, no. What, what no, do they? no, no, no. They they eat uh, chow, like dry, uh, squashed wheat, and and like um, um, carbohydrates mostly. Oh. Okay. Mostly. Okay. Yeah. So so they just uh, these dry pellets. They eat. Mm. They don't eat meat. They like cheese. So uh, <laughs> they 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 like the animal protein, I guess, yeah, yeah, and the yeah. fats. They yeah. they're like humans. They yeah, like yeah. the the processed uh, stuff. They also like like creams. People uh, make them fat by eating them in creams. <laughs> um, I don't think they eat meat actually. Well, and finally, um, I think this is uh, something important. I think really. Um, how to bring a more scientific approach into the mainstream, especially with, you know, all the misinformation uh, online and on social media. What's your what's your take? What are your solutions? The, the only solution is to provide better information and attract more followers, not actively fighting misinformation. I think I don't think it works uh, or maybe. But then on your platform that, that you have a little bit more credibility. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, and, and, and the mainstream is also because there's a lot of misinformation or, or misinformation, just not correctly uh, stated information, mostly about nutrition, because the I think the major problem with nutrition is that it's, it's very hard to do intervention studies, mm -hmm. like clear intervention studies, for example, are avocados uh, healthy? Mm -hmm. Question. Very difficult to, to look at uh, from a scientific point of view because you would have to do a kind of an intervention study where you have thousands of people that come into the lab, have a, have a, have a certain diet, and then uh, this diet is supplemented with avocados or not with avocados, mm -hmm. right? And this you cannot do. It's too expensive. People won't come to the lab. It's very, very hard. So what people do now, like most of the nutrition sciences is, they just look at two groups. One group eats avocados. One does not eat avocados. Mm -hmm. And then they check, mostly uh, look at it, and they say, oh, the blood parameters and the body composition of the avocado eaters is better. So the mainstream media puts it causally, saying avocados are healthy. Mm -hmm. It's not the right way to do it because it could be that there's, even though there's, yeah, there could be some confounding factors, and mm -hmm. it's very hard to control for them. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the avocado eaters uh, um, are from a higher socioeconomic class; they uh, eat better in general, or they do more exercise. Right. So. It's just very hard with nutrition science to, to have a causal effect. And that's why just the, the misinterpreted um, information just comes mm -hmm. into the mainstream media. It's not mm -hmm. only the journalist's fault, I think. Um, but it is confusing for the, for the people. It is. So, so, and, yeah. and, and, but do you think um, universities perhaps should play a more active role they, they, in promoting science in the uh, mainstream? It's, it's a very good question. Um, it's an issue in, 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 in universities. So maybe I can talk about this uh, quickly. Four years ago, I was exactly struggling with this question. So I was doing science, I think applied science, quite interesting science for general public, the effect of exercise, the effect of sport sciences, right? And I, I was thinking many people would actually benefit what I, what I read, what I do. So yeah, the, the university doesn't really spread this information, it just um, 
yeah, they they teach their students, which is 100 people, 200 people or so, but not, of course, the, 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 the public. And I think it's actually a service of the university to actively uh, educate or try to educate in a yeah, in a nice manner, the public about what has been found, like in a good way, not uh, putting out the blog on the ETH websites that literally mm-hmm. no one reads, right? This is just a fact. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I just did, I said, yeah, uh, screw that. I will just start my own uh, science communication page uh, called What Science Workout of the Day. And we're just going to read interesting papers that we always do in our work and try to explain them in five to six slides for normal people. And clearly there was a niche for this because this took off like crazy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have like 110,000 followers now. Really a lot of people are interested and in, in asking, hey, this is cool what you guys do. So there's a, there's a need. And universities, they, I don't know, they don't really do this. And I find this interesting. Uh, they should, I honestly think they should have one researcher per research group, 50% paid to actively try to explain Signs from the group to the to the to the the public. I think this is one of the things they could do instead of letting some PhDs doing uh, maybe less interesting work. They could actually try to get them out on social media, get them out on on YouTube, mm-hmm. have a good platform. Um, and yeah, it doesn't really happen. They, there's no incentive. I don't really understand why. They, I've never been contacted. Also, I mean, yeah, as I said, we have we have quite some reach, and no one. The university cares too much, although mm-hmm. they should, in my opinion. But that, that's mm-hmm. a, yeah. My view. Um, I um, I took a look at your platform, and it's it's absolutely amazing. Um, there is a lot of information about exercise and fitness, yep. and you are welcome to let our listeners know what the exact link or page is on Instagram or web page, whatever you want to. Share with us. Yeah, it's um, go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, it's very simple. It's uh, W O D what and then signs on Instagram, and we now recently also launched um, a site, inter- internet site, where you can uh, what uh, dash signs dot com easy findable on Google, uh, where you can find like an archive of all our posts. So that's I think quite interesting. Is that people uh, come around and they, every day we get D- DMs it's like, hey, you you posted something about. Um, uh, how to maximize your um, strength gains in CrossFit or something, and then but we couldn't find it in the in the feed because there's no search function. Mm-hmm. So now we have this on the the site. You can just log in and find those um, those posts. You can searchable as well. So yeah, that's um, it's 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 a hobby. As I said, it's I'd never been paid by the university to do this. It was all. At uh, whatever in, in the during the evenings and when I had time to actually make these posts and yeah I think it's important uh, as a scientist to it's an important job as a scientist and it it's not done enough. Yes, uh, well it's an incredible platform and we will uh, spread the word as well. Thank you, thank you. So uh, yes, it's been uh, really interesting. Yeah, almost one hour I think or time flies. an hour. Um, I had a lot of fun. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming again. You, and perhaps at some point we can have I can, part two. I can uh-huh. always uh, come back and, and talk about a specific study or okay. something that uh, could be interesting for your listeners. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.